Oh, hi, I'm Abby. This is Hugh and this is Sarah, and we're from Calvary Chapel a Church around the corner from here. And we are doing a, serve, a spiritual survey, and we'd like to know if you would help us out by answering a few questions. Okay. So, according to a recent survey, there's a rise um, of interest in religion today. Are you more interested in spiritual things today than you were five years ago? I think so. Do you see God as a supreme being being to whom you must ultimately answer to? Yes. Okay. Do you in some way pray every day? Um, I try to, maybe not every day. Okay. Do you t attend a church, temple, or synagogue? No, not church. Okay. Do you think that a religious group should help people prepare for life after death? And what's your first name? Rich. All right, Rich. It's nice to meet you. Have you come to a place in your spiritual life where you know for certain that if you were to die today, you would go to heaven? Hmm. That's a good question. Uh, I haven't really thought about it like that, but I think maybe. Maybe? Okay. Um, that's interesting because we know for certain that we're going to go to heaven. The Bible actually says these things are written so that you may know for certain that you have eternal life. Can I share with you what the Bible has to say about eternal life? Okay. Now, I have one more question for you. If you were to die today and stand before God, and He were to say to you, why should I let you into my heaven, what would you say? Well, I come from a pretty good family, and um, I've never been arrested. And, you know, I try and do things that are good. So you're a good person. Not Committed any crimes or hurt anybody? Yeah. Okay. Alright. Well, I have some really good news for you. Heaven is a free gift. The Bible actually says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So heaven is a free gift. It's unmerited, it's undeserved. There's nothing here on earth we can do to earn a place in heaven. It's sort of like if I were to give you a gift, a Rolex watch, right? We all know those are pretty expensive and, you know, it's a really nice gift to give. And let's say you tried to give me a few dollars for it. Let's say five dollars. You want to give me five dollars for it. Then I actually took the five dollars from you. The gift I've just given you is no longer free. And we all know that five dollars can't pay for a Rolex watch, right? That's like heaven. Heaven is... A, an expensive gift for us, but God gives it to us for free. There's nothing here on earth we can do to save a place for us in heaven. And from here, Sarah will share some more. I feel that's true when we tend to think of the best gifts, we think of expensive things. Um, but when God offers us heaven as a free gift, it's because He loves us and He wants us to be with Him. Um, but we can't earn it and we can't deserve it because of the nature of man. And the Bible says that man is a sinner. All of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. That you know, when it says that there's no one righteous, no, not one, it doesn't mean that nobody does good things. Because I like to do good things. I'm sure you sound like you do a lot of good things. But it means there's nobody who does all good things and never does anything wrong. So, what would you say the definition of sin? Would be? What is a sin? Hmm. Well, you know, I, I know the Ten Commandments a little bit. I know you're not supposed to lie. Mm -hmm. And definitely not murder. That's true. Things like that. The big things. The things we, sh we should not do. Um, and sometimes do anyway. Or the things, the Bible says it can be things that we should do and we don't. Like uh, seeing someone who needs help and we don't reach out to help them. Um, Jesus even takes it a step further and says even your thoughts can be sin. So if you look at a person with hate, you've already committed murder in your heart. Or if you look at a person with lust, Jesus says you're already committing adultery with that person in your heart. So when we stand before God and God knows our thoughts, there are a lot of sins that we can commit. And me, me being me, if you know, when I start to think through my day, I start racking up sin pretty quickly. Um, say I were to try to be really, really good and cut it down to three. I think that would be better than I could do. And I think I would be a pretty good person. I mean, even just driving down the freeway, I commit three sins right there. 
Let's say I were to cut it down to three, and I'm being super extra good, and over the course of the week, the month, the year, it, it wraps up. Over a year, that's um, over a thousand sins. And over the course of a lifetime, that's 70, 80,000 sins. So even when we think of small sins, we have a lot of sin to deal with. And if you were to stand before a judge with a, you know, and say, hey, I've got some traffic tickets, he might, he might be gracious. But if you were to say, hey, I have 70,000 <laughs> traffic tickets, um, there's some justice that has to be dealt there. Um, a lot of times we think, okay, well, maybe even if I commit a lot of sin, they're just small sins, right? And I can be good and do good things to try to balance out the things I've done wrong. But really, um, our lives are more like water, pure water. And every time, every time you do a good deed, you're adding in, you know, a drop of pure water. In and you do a sin, you're adding in a, a drop of poison. How much poison do you like in your water? I don't like it either. I don't like it either. How many, how many drops of poison in your water before you won't drink it at all? One. One. And the same thing goes with heaven. God says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Nobody's perfect, right? But all it takes to keep us out of heaven is one sin, just one. Because sin and heaven are like oil and water, they don't mix. It makes sense because God is perfect and just and holy and where he lives is perfect. And if you were to just let one sinner in, then heaven wouldn't be a perfect place anymore. So there's a standard that God has kept for heaven. And the Bible says that there are actually books up in heaven keeping record of all of our sin. So there's a book with my name on it. It has Sarah, it has my birth certificate, it has my death certificate, and it has all the sins I've ever committed written on the pages. Um, and this poses a problem for me because it keeps me separated from God, whether it's a thin book or whether it's a really thick book. It's separating me from God, and I can't get to Him because of the sin. Um, when you think of God, you think of love. Why? Because he's described himself that way. He, he loves us with an everlasting love. Um, he is the definition and the expression of love. The Bible's full of places that talk about how much he loves us. But the same Bible that talks about his love also talks about his justice. He's perfect in both. He's perfect in his love and he's perfect in his justice. And true justice must punish sin. So even though he loves us and he wants to give us heaven, we can't earn it. We can't deserve it. We can't get in on our own merits because it's a gift. We can't get in because we're sinful and our sin keeps us out of heaven. But it gets even worse because of his justice. And true justice must punish sin. The Bible says that, uh, God says in the Bible, I will by no means clear the guilty. He's going to punish every single one of our sins. When that, when that day comes, he's going to open that book. And he's going to read about all of my sins, and he's going to read about all of yours, and they will be punished no matter how much he loves us. If you think, I mean, you've never committed a crime, you said. You're a good person. I, I've never, you know, been arrested either, but say I hit hard times, and I go out and rob a bank. I have no idea what I'm doing, and I get caught right away, as you can imagine. So they haul me before the judge, and I say, Look, Judge, I've, I've never done anything like this before. Can you please just forget about it and sweep it under the rug? I, I didn't hurt anybody. I gave the money back. I won't rob a bank again. If the judge is a just judge, can he just erase that? Can he let me go? I think so. That's right. If he's a just judge, if I committed the crime, I have to pay the penalty for that. What happens if I live in a very small town and the only judge available to hear my case is my friend who loves me very much, we grew up together, we're best friends. My friend is that judge. My friend doesn't want to punish me, but my friend being a just judge, can they, can they let that friendship interfere with true justice? 
Only if your name is Hillary Clinton. No. Oh my gosh. I'm just thinking the same thing. <laughs> True justice. We're talking true justice. <laughs> <laughs> right. Not even for my friend. And that's where we stand before God, and it's a really deep pit to be in because there's really no way we can get out of it. And because God loves us so much, that's why He sent Jesus. So, who would you say that Jesus is? Oh, well, you know, I've been in the Catholic Church a couple of times, and, and I know that he died on the cross. Um, he was the Son of God. Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I don't think he. I don't think he sinned. You're right. I'm not. I'm, I'm not absolutely sure the white died on the cross when I look at it like that. But I know he's the Son of God. Okay. Well, you've got a great start. Um, all of those things are true in the Bible. Jesus is the Son of God. He's also God, the Son. Um, and Jesus has a lot of different names in the Bible. He's the living water, the bread of life, the beginning and the end. And in the beginning of the book of John, he's described as the Word. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And later on in the book of John, it says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the only begotten Son of the Father. So that's talking about Christmas. When Jesus came down, he is God. He came down and he was born of the Virgin Mary, and he lived a life just like any of us. He was 100% human, but he was also God, and he, he fell down and scraped his knees, he was burped, he had his diapers changed. He went through all of the same things that we go through, with one huge difference, and you pointed it out, he never sinned. And that's the huge difference, because he came with a mission, and he knew why he came. He came willingly to die on the cross, to pay... The punishment for a crime he did not commit. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And when he died on the cross, he didn't have any sin to pay for. So he was able to pay for your sin, Rich, and Abby's sin, and my sin, and all of the sin of the entire world. And because he was sinless, he was able to pay for it. And at the, at the end, when he, when he was dying, he said the word to Telestai which is a word that was found on ancient documents or bills that says, this bill is finished, this invoice is paid in full. And that's huge. That's talking about my invoice, my bill. It's finished, it's paid in full. He paid for it fully, and on every page he stamped, tis telestai, paid in full. So that, his death brings me up from debt to zero. So now I don't have any sin to pay for because Christ was punished for my iniquity. He took all of my punishment on the cross, and he gave me all his righteousness. He brought me up to zero, but then he did more than that. He rose from the dead because he is God. He bore all the wrath that God could pour out that no one ever could bear but himself. And then he rose from the dead and turned around and held out his hand and said, now come on, take my righteousness. I'll take your sin. You know, take my righteousness and come on in. And that's how heaven is a free gift. Because he takes our sin and he offers us his perfection. And well, that, that sounds too good to <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's, it's there in the Bible. So at that point, you have a decision to make. Because how on earth are you supposed to accept this gift? It, the Bible says it's for everybody. The most famous verse in the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will have everlasting life. Not perish, but have eternal life. So how do you how do you accept the gift? You can't unwrap it with a bow. The answer that, to that lies in faith. You have to accept it with saving faith. It's like the key that unlocks the door. Um, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. He is the only way to get into heaven. Just like um, I have a lot of keys on my keychain, but only one opens the door into my into my house. Jesus says you have to trust in me with saving faith. What saving faith is not is just knowing who he is and what he did. Because you can know about a person and you can know what they did, but that doesn't mean that you know them. I can know all about our president, I can know what he's done, but that doesn't mean that when I knock on his door, they're going to let me in. 
The Bible says you believe in God, you do well. Even the demons believe, and they tremble. They know better than we do who Jesus is and what he did, but that doesn't mean they'll be in him. The second thing that saving faith is not is trusting in him for temporal things or things of this world, which are great things to trust him for. You can trust him for your health and your finances, and you can get on a plane and you can pray, Lord, get me safe to the other side. And those are good things, but when you land and you walk away and you forget, that's not the type of faith that saves you for eternity. Saving faith is transferring your trust from yourself and all the things you're trusting in to get you to heaven onto Jesus Christ and him alone and what he did, the work he accomplished on the cross. And it's saying, Jesus, I'm going to take all of my faith off of myself and I'm going to rest it 100% on you and just step back. Is that something that you would like to do? I'm pretty sure I would. Excellent. Wonderful. Then I'll go ahead and pray with you, but before I do, I'll do a few more clarifications. Because when you accept Christ as, as um, you know, transfer your trust onto Him, you're doing a few different things. You're acknowledging Him as your Savior. You're saying, Jesus, I can't do it myself. I need to be saved. I'm drowning here in sin, and people who are drowning can't just decide, I'm not going to drown anymore. I need a Savior, and I need it to be you. Would you like to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? Yes. Okay. Excellent. A lot of people are willing to be saved, but not as many are willing to accept Christ as Lord. But God is God, and Jesus Christ is Lord, and we are not. And we have to accept that. And we have to say, Lord, I'm going to take myself off of the throne of my heart, out of the driver's seat, and I'm going to acknowledge you because you are the king and I'm not. Would you like to accept Jesus Christ as Lord? Yes. Excellent. Very good. Um, it also means that you transfer your trust. You can't trust in Christ and the good works that you were talking about to get you into heaven. You have to take them off of what you were trusting in before and put them on to Jesus Christ alone. It's a lot like bumping down a river on a log. And you're hanging on to this log because it's it's keeping you afloat. But we all know that there's a waterfall at the end. And that log is not going to help you when you get to that waterfall. But when Christ comes along to the river's edge and reaches out his hand, you have to make a decision. You can't grab onto Jesus and the log. It's just not gonna work. Mm -hmm. You have to let go of the log, and you have to put all of your weight on Christ and let him pull you out. Would you like to acknowledge that now? Um, yeah, I'm not sure what to say. Yes. Okay, very good. And the last thing that it means is to repent. And that word has got a lot of bad rap um, with a lot of people walking around. But what that means is you turn 180 degrees and you stop running after sin, and you start running towards Christ and running towards God, it basically means turning away from danger and running towards safety. And that means running towards God instead of chasing down the sin. So does that mean that I won't ever do anything wrong again or I won't sin? I wish it did. <laughs> but it doesn't. We keep sinning every day, every five minutes. I, I sin all day long. But what that means is I don't delight in it anymore. I don't chase it down. Every time I do sin, I just, I give it to the Lord. I don't beat myself up over, over it either, but I give it to the Lord just all day long. I put it in his hands because I trust them that he's big enough to carry it, and I'm not diving into it to chase it anymore. So basically, it's a relief of that burden because you're, you're taking it off of your own shoulders, and you're putting it into his hands. Once again, transferring your trust. Would you like to do that as well? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. And I'm going to go ahead and pray with you. You repeat after me. But I want you to know, it has nothing to do with the words that you say. The words are not magic words at all. It has everything to do with what you're saying in your heart to God. Because he hears you. And he's taking you seriously. Okay. So, dear Jesus. Dear Jesus. I come to you now. I come to you now. I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I'm a sinner. And that I have not deserved heaven. I have not deserved heaven. But I know that you died to take away all my sin. 
And I know that you died to take away all of my sins. I put myself in your hands and I, I accept your gift. I put myself in your hands and I accept your gift. Come into my heart and be my Lord and my Savior. Come into my heart and be my Lord and my Savior. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. And lead me in the way you want me to go. And lead me in the way you want me to go. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to the family of God. Amen. <laughs>